Yoga. I'm Dale Bowman. I'm the husband of the assistant librarian at Limestone Library. Um, I'm. Some of you may remember that I used to host a, a show called Outside on on WKCC when uh, KCC still had a radio station, which I really enjoyed doing the show. I also do the outdoors column for the Chicago Sun-Times. I'm not an expert birder. I do enjoy doing it, and I've had some good adventures over the way. Uh, don't I am I consider myself very ordinary when it comes to birding. I have the same question that most of you probably have. If you're kind of experienced, this is probably maybe you'll get a few tips out of it, maybe not. But uh, if you're new or thinking about wanting to expand, hopefully I can give you a, a few ideas and, and tips. Um, I think birding is like doing anything in the outdoors, and that's the, the first step is just look and listen. Uh, uh, the listening point was really driven home this year. Uh, I was we had a hummingbird feeder out and we weren't getting any hummingbirds but all of a sudden I hear this loud noise a racket and it and it's an, a Baltimore Oriole and once you hear the sound one time it's the distinctive enough that you will recognize at any time and I, I suspect that most of us if you if you think back over your life enough uh, you probably know the sounds of more birds than you realize. I bet you know the sound of a, a morning dove. Almost everybody can recognize that. Um, you probably have heard a hawk and didn't realize it was a hawk, but eventually if you pay attention, you can learn to recognize that. But it's so the point, I mean, that is really the first step. Learn to look and listen. Learn uh, to just see the bird. You may just think they're a sparrow and then... Uh, come to realize that it's a finch and and in the winter time especially it can be very difficult to distinguish finches from sparrows when they're in their very drab color which brings me to to the basics of birding uh, if you want to get gong-ho you can drop thousands upon thousands of dollars and I assure you there are people who have binoculars and cameras that are worth far more than all three of our cars put together. Um, you can go that route or you can be very simple and simply have a, this is a hummingbird feeder, or you can get the regular uh, bird feeders down at Farm and Fleet or wherever uh, you want to do that. Uh, I would, there, if you're going to do feeding, I would recommend doing the hummingbird feeder during the season for that the suet feeder, which is a basket if you have a tree uh, that you can put it on or, or somewhere that it, it works. It helps if it's on a tree because woodpeck, woodpeckers are primary uh, users of the suet feeders. Not the only ones, but the primary ones. And then uh, a basic a basic uh, seed feeder, which I think most of you know, they're the cylinders of various sizes that you put bird, bird food into. Um, and then there is a specialized thistle feeder, which is for finches and a couple other birds, but in our area primarily for um, house finches and goldfinches. If you want goldfinches, it helps to have, um, if you have sunflowers in your garden, it helps. Uh, or if you have sunflowers nearby, it helps. But uh, you, you really want a thistle feeder if you want to draw the, the finches in. And that, I mean, those things you can get relatively inexpensively. Or, I mean, I suppose you can probably find them even if, if we ever start having garage sales on a major scale again. You can probably find some at a garage sale. Um, and then when I talked earlier about look and listen, a pair of binoculars. Now, you can get a basic pair for relatively inexpensive. And if you're mainly looking out in your backyard, that is perfectly fine. If you end up becoming very gung-ho about it, you'll want to get a good pair. Uh, I have one really good pair that was actually given to me by a farmer who had died, and it was he had written, he had told his daughter that 
he was to give them to me. And I, I feel very honored to have them. But, but that's for very specialized things. But it helps for birds. The reason for binoculars, one, is so that you can actually see them, but two, so that you can identify them. Speaking of which, I just heard a, a doves make a very distinctive sound when you when they fly. I'm not sure you'll be able to pick that up, but one flew just behind me. I could hear it. I was trying to see it on the screen, but I couldn't, but it, it flew right behind me. Um, and then there are other things. You can get books. Um, probably the most basic books are David Sibley's. Uh, he has a whole series of them. He has is kind of the classic book. Uh, Kaufman's Field Guide is another classic one. Um, and then um, for those in in our region, this is an interesting read. If, if you get more involved in uh, uh, birding, I would highly recommend this. Or if you just like a little bit of history mixed in with your birding, Joel Greenberg and Lynn Carpenter's A Birder's Guide to the Chicago Region, which goes over all uh, kinds of, all around the area, basically, uh, what is it, from southwest Michigan to... Uh, uh, southeast Wisconsin and circles our area but I think in this day and age probably at least I to be honest I'd love to tell you that I'm if I have a bird question I'm diligently digging out a book I'm not I I'm like everybody else I go online and what I look for is all about birds.org it's Cornell ornithology um, and they break it down in a very useful format it doesn't weigh you down with scientific uh, language. The scientific language is there and the science is there, but they present it in a manner that, that is very useful. They have everything. You can get the sound of the birds, and birds don't always make the same sound. The cardinal in spring, when they're uh, late winter, when they're staking out territory, make a much different sound than they do uh, later in the year. Um, so that's, I, I would think that's all about birds.org. Uh, it's Cornell uh, Ornithology. Um, and then uh, it also helps. Um, there are online groups such as IBET, which stands for Illinois Birders Exchanging Thoughts. That's jumped around a couple times, but you can still find them. Uh, there's several Facebook groups, and depending where you live, you might have a more specialized one. And I would highly recommend using them because the the advantage of Facebook uh, groups is uh, you can just slap a question in and you'll get an answer. And surprisingly, uh, unlike many things on Facebook, the the bird answers tend to be very thoughtful and good. I, I find the bird groups that I belong to on Facebook very very helpful in terms of answering basic questions. And I, I would just say, in terms of asking basic questions, if you don't know something, ask. Don't be, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, it, it's be far better to ask a, a question and find out the answer than than to uh, just say, "Hey, I saw a, uh, a raven." Well, if you saw a raven in Illinois, you kind of made history, and there'd be a ton of people be at your door and want to know exactly where this raven was. So, I mean, it, it just Ask basic questions. Legitimate birders will a answer basic questions. I mean, uh, most of them are, are trying to uh, help the world get bird better in terms of birds and birders. Um, what a, speaking of the world getting better, if you have a garden and do that stuff, you can uh, enhance your possibilities of seeing uh, birds. I think I mentioned earlier about sunflowers are great, one of the great attractors for goldfinches. One of the other things is uh, if you have an area, put your hummingbird feeder in an area where there are bright flowers that have that uh, have nectar that they like to attract to. Uh, my wife used to have uh, hanging baskets in our old house that I would put the uh, hummingbird feeder right next to. And you could see sometimes the hummingbirds would actually flit or buzz, whatever you want to call what hummingbirds do from the feeder to the birds, and, uh, to the uh, flowers in the hanging basket and that kind of stuff. Um, 
And then what I had at the very beginning, I mentioned look and listen. I had mentioned a little bit more about listening and just learn what a listen, learn what a, a kingfisher flying off at a lake sounds like because they make a very distinctive sound. And if and uh, it also happens, this is where the look part comes in. Kingfishers have a very distinctive flight, and it, and if you start to put the two together, the flight and the distinctive call. You can instantly go, oh, there's a belted kingfisher when you're out at a pond somewhere and hear that sound take off or the squawking of a, a great blue heron. Those are things to do. But when you look, when I was talking about binoculars too earlier, what you want to do is look for specific things, color, um, pattern of color, because I, I have, I'm a duck hunter and I just love ducks, but man, they are, can be, some of them can be really hard to tell apart you get a black and white duck you really have to look what um, you know is the the head white and the shoulders black uh, you know is the back black and the, uh, so the more specific you can get when you go to look up a, a description of them the better off you're gonna be so I mean the more if if you're a note taker take notes there's nothing wrong with taking notes obviously in this day and age I think a lot of us reach in our pocket or or backpack and grab our phone and take a photo and that's perfect or a video uh, that'll usually work too especially if you have a friend who's very adept at birding um, quite frankly that's often where I get most of my questions answered is, is uh, by friends saying oh you know say blah 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 whatever um, the color the patterns the other thing I had mentioned about kingfishers do that Birds have different flights. Uh, insect eaters will do more of that kind of flight. Um, and then you'll have uh, hawks and vultures that will literally float on, float and not even seem to be flying, but just riding on the thermals, uh, which is always an interesting sight, I think. Uh, that's, that's another part of the looking, is looking at what they're doing. Um, you watch a hummingbird they will attack other hummingbirds who are attempting to use the feeder. And if you watch them when they fly off, watch where they go to, watch where they go to rest and that kind of stuff. And you can learn about them. Um, watch how a, a, a dove will, uh, will fly when, it, when it's in a hurry and when, they, when they're not in a hurry. Doves, by the way, are notoriously terrible nest builders. If you have a thunderstorm and see a nest on the ground, pretty good odds are that you have a, a morning dove that's attempting to nest in your um, area. And speaking of, of looking, there, doves are a perfect example. Our area is getting a, a great deal of Eurasian collared doves. Um, they have a, a collar, a dark collar. That's one of their distinctive, their name comes from. They also have a much blockier tail. They're slightly bigger than a morning dove, but they have a much blockier tail that if you get a photo and compare them, you can tell. And they also have a, a, a very distinctive sound. That's one of the things we're going to say if you learn to look and listen. Um, and you can walk down the street in the evening and you can go, oh, somebody's got a pair of Eurasian collar doves in their, in their yard. It's, it's a distinctive sound worth listening for. And then, I guess, birding should be joyful. It should bring you joy. It should ease your life. At least I think so. But it should also be a way of, of, uh, of appreciating nat the natural world and, and looking to improve it. Um, there are things you can do in your yard. If you get more advanced, you'll learn how to do some of that. Uh, some of the things that work for um, pollinators also help the birds, too. Um, and we'll draw them in. But one of the, uh, the last thing I wanted to wrap up with is we live in a pretty cool area for birding. Um, we have the Kankakee River State Park, which is a fabulous thing. Um, one of the things that the park in the recent years has become notable for, we have a fair number of eagle, bald eagles that use it, and also a fair number of ospreys, which are the fish catching fish. One of the coolest things I saw was uh, I was out actually fishing one day in Bourbon A and saw an, a bald eagle come. Bald eagles, by the way, are, are kind of notorious scavengers and thieves. 
um, I saw a bald eagle. I saw an osprey come down. Uh, I forget the name of the park in Bourbonnais there. It's the one uh, near the sewage plant. Um, I saw an uh, osprey come down and grab a, a fish out of the, the Kankakee River and start flying off, and a bald eagle swoops in, just steals the fish, and goes on its way. That's our, that's a bald eagle. That's not on typical behavior, but but we have, there are other birds, especially in the spring, Kankakee River State Park is is a, is a, a real wander, a uh, place of wander that you can wander around in. So the other one that, um, and this is a totally different set of birds utilize this one, is, is Perry Farm because it's a huge prairie landscape and, and you find many different things. Um, and on a much grander scale than Perry Farm is Medewin uh, National Tallgrass Prairie over by Wilmington. Just, I personally, that's just one of my favorite spots to hang at. I'm not, when I'm there, it tends not to be for birding, but I notice the birds because they have some interesting ones. But I, I just enjoy uh, uh, trying to learn more about the prairie plants over there. Uh, we have a... Uh, if you really get into it, you will learn about Miller Beach in Indiana. It's on the south end of Lake Michigan, just across the line in Indiana. It's a, one of the miraculous places to watch migrating birds in the spring and fall. And it draws people by the dozens there. Uh, the other one you probably have heard of is uh, uh, the Sandhill Cranes and occasionally a Whooping Crane over at Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area in Indiana. Um, it's a little bit southeast of, of Valparaiso, so it's a bit of a drive, but I, it's worth it, and I do it generally at least once, sometimes twice a fall. You can do it in the spring, but the fall is a much more dramatic time, and you basically want to be there at the hour before sunset, because after sunset, it's like the switch goes off, and all of a sudden the sandhill cranes are not flying, but when they're flying, uh, and you get right around Thanksgiving tends to be the peak. You can get 20,000 some sandhill cranes that are piled into this one little fish and wildlife area. And there's a great viewing tower. There, it's handicapped accessible. And that's when it really helps to have good binoculars at. And uh, uh, there is a, a scope and stuff up there, but it, that, that's a, an area, a trip I highly recommend around Thanksgiving, go over and see the sandhill cranes at Jasper Pulaski. If you got any questions, you can always reach me at bowmanoutside at gmail.com. I'm not an expert, but I can probably point you to someone who is. Thanks.